So our lecture will be, uh, before I introduce the speaker, our lecture will be about an hour. Um, Prof. Sievers will be here uh, to answer questions. You can come down here at the end. Uh, so our, professor, our speaker tonight is Professor Jonathan Sievers. Um, uh, he received his PhD in astronomy at Caltech, then went on to do a postdoc at the Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics. Then he went to Princeton University to be an associate research scholar for two years. And then he went to South Africa to the University of KwaZulu-Natal, if I pronounced that correctly. And he was a research professor and a lead developer in uh, the Hyrax uh, Telescope Array. Then last year he came here at McGill and he's now a professor with us and he's giving a first, his first public lecture. So please welcome him. Well, thank you all for coming out. Um, needless to say, we didn't have weather like this in South Africa. Is that? Uh, other side. Okay. Okay, great. And let me steal this. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, today I think I'm uh, going to try and tell you about um, a little bit about the universe. Uh, and um, maybe you've heard of this that uh, astronomers have got a, a very strange picture for what the universe looks like on its largest scales. Um, a, a really strange one. Um, so why do we come up with such a strange model and why do we think it might actually be right? Um, so this is uh, the oldest in the universe, which I'll tell you more about, and this is one of the primary lines of evidence we have for understanding what we think the universe actually looks like on its larger scales today. So uh, the study of the universe on its larger scales is called cosmology. And uh, it asks questions like, how and when did the universe begin? What is it made out of? What is the fate? Um, how did things get to look the way, the way they do? And this is everybody's favorite uh, cosmology woodcut um, from Flammarion where it shows somebody trying to peek through uh, the atmosphere and see the universe outside. And that's actually a, a very good analogy because we, we, we hate the atmosphere in astronomy. Um, I mean, we have to breathe, sadly, but if we're for that, just get rid of it. Um, well, we can answer these questions by building specialized telescopes and looking at various bits of information about the universe. So modern, modern cosmology really started, um, maybe, maybe you've, you've heard of this guy, Edwin, Edwin Hubble, Hubble um, has a telescope named after him. And his big claim to fame was uh, in the 1920s, he looked at galaxies and he said, oh look, um, I, uh, I can see um, that hydrogen looks a little bit, uh, hydrogen lines look a little bit uh, redder than they should. And so the interpretation of that is that the galaxies were moving away from us. Um, and, and it turned, turned out that they were moving away from us no matter which direction you look in. And also that the further gal away the, a galaxy was, the faster it was moving away from us. And in fact, the velocity is just proportional, um, if you're close by, the velocity is just proportional to the distance. And that constant proportionality is called Hubble's constant. So every time you go uh, a megaparsec away, which is about three million light years, a galaxy is moving 70 kilometers a second faster away from you. And the interpretation of this is, well, if I just watch all the galaxies, they're all getting further and further and further away from me, which means the universe is expanding. And so this was really the first, the first time um, we had, there was a real line of evidence about what the universe was really kind of doing with itself. Um, but there's a corollary to that, which is that uh, if the universe is expanding today and it gets bigger in the future, uh, as we go backwards in time, it's, it, it gets smaller. So if, it's, if it, you know, it had to expand to get to where we are now. And um, if you take this result to its logical uh, extreme, um, then if you just track everything backwards and at the beginning of time, like there was a beginning of time for starters, which is kind of a weird idea, um, the universe was, was uh, arbitrarily sm small and there was some big explosion that started things off. Um, so it was a sufficiently big explosion, we call it the Big Bang. Um, it was actually made up by somebody who hated it and was trying to make fun of it. But uh, the name stuck, and we've uh, periodically, you know, every 10 or 20 years, we've tried to come up with a better name, and so far nobody has. So uh, this is it. Um, it's the Big Bang. But uh, this, this is really seems like kind of flimsy evidence. Uh, I, I look at a bunch of nearby galaxies and see they're moving away from me, and the further away they are, the faster they're moving. That seems like flimsy evidence to say, oh, man, the universe started as, like, 
a, a point, point explosion, explosion. Uh, right? So, so fortunately, fortunately, we do have other lines, lines of evidence. Of evidence. Um, you experienced one, one of them tonight, tonight which, which is the night sky is dark. dark. Um, well, well, that's obvious, obvious right? But it's, it's actually not so obvious, obvious when you stop to think about it. About um, it. If, if the universe, universe was static and infinitely large, if you look out, eventually, in any given spot, if you go far enough, you'll hit a star. And um, the surface brightness, so if I take the sun and move it away, it doesn't, you know, when I look at the sun, it doesn't look any fainter, it just looks smaller. And so if everywhere I look, I hit a star, um, then the whole sky should be as bright as the sun. So this is the Wikipedia illustration. Um, if I keep adding more and more suns that are smaller and smaller and further and further away, eventually the sky fills up and the entire sky is as bright as the sun. Now this clearly doesn't happen, the sky is dark. And that right there is enough to tell you that the universe can't be a simple, static, infinitely large, infinitely old universe. Um, I know, right? Kind of trippy. Uh, but there's some more evidence. Um, in fact, you have probably all of you some in your pockets right now, unless you're bored already and playing with them. Um, <clears throat> in the past, the universe, uh, if this picture is right, in the past, the universe was small and hot. Well, what, what happens to hydrogen if you heat it up enough? And, and squish it down, down enough. Pardon? Pardon? Turns, it turns into helium, helium. yeah, it blows up. We have, we have bombs made out of this, we, we have stars. stars. Um, actually, actually uh, the, the sun, sun takes billions of years to do this, so even the sun's, sun's, sun's not very exciting as far as this goes. goes. But, but if, if you, you say, say right, um, I, really I really believe that this is what happened, happened then um, if, if you track the progress forward, you see that when the universe was a few minutes old, it was about the right temperature to burn hydrogen into helium. But not just that, it also makes traces of deuterium. Uh, which, which is hydrogen with one proton and one neutron, and, and it makes uh, lithium, and it makes helium-3, which is helium that has two protons but only one neutron. And um, you can make predictions, you know, if you work through the nuclear physics, um, so this is not especially high temperature, this is, this is temperature that people, you know, it's lower temperatures than people have in bombs. Um, if, you, if you work through this, um, then you say, right, well, I think the universe should be, you know, 24% helium and 0.1% and deuterium and like a part in 100,000 helium-3 and a part, in, you know, a few parts in a billion of lithium, or actually less than a part in a billion of lithium. Um, and so uh, if you go out and look and say, and say, right, I actually see that all these different things line up and, and that I see that much deuterium and that much helium, um, then maybe that means that the universe really was at least as of th three minutes after the supposed Big Bang, um, that it was indeed you know, as hot and as dense as, we think it, as, as you think it would be just from running the Hubble law backwards. And modern data do agree with this, um, and I will just, we'll come back to this later on. And so this lithium number, it's a little bit low, so people are concerned about this in the field because it's like a factor of two off of where it should be. But remember, that is less than, a, you know, it's down by a factor of a billion from the helium level, or in the hydrogen level. So the fact that we're off by a factor of two when you're off by a factor of a billion already that you got correct is still pretty impressive. So this is not a thing that keeps me up at night. Um, also stars burn lithium very easily and so it's really easy to destroy it. So probably it just got destroyed before we could find it. Um, also things that are only a part in a billion are really hard to measure too. It's not, not easy to see the lithium. So, um, right. So, it, it turns out, though, that that little bit of lithium, lithium um, because, because stars are really good at, at, at destroying lithium, lithium, that basically almost all, the large majority of the lithium on the Earth was, was created in the Big Bang. Bang. So, so your Tesla, Tesla, if you happen to have a Tesla, Tesla somebody in your neighborhood does, um, that, 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 that the lithium batteries, those batteries come from the Big Bang. Bang. Your cell phone battery comes from the Big Bang. I know, and like, stars really, you know, stars really do not make lithium. It'd be like starting a coal fire and expecting to produce lighter fluid. That's just not how the universe works. Um, so, so they, yeah, this, the lithium in your cell phone dates from 10 minutes after the Big Bang. And um, this also makes a prediction, though. Um, so if, uh, if uh, the universe started out hot and like, hot enough to, like, fuse hydrogen into helium. In fact, I mean, look at this number. So you... It kind of seems abstract, but uh, um, in the first three minutes, 25% of the hydrogen in the universe uh, fused into helium. So compare that to like the sun, which is going to fuse about 10% of its hydrogen into helium over billions of years. Um, and the Big Bang was so big that we don't even worry about the fact that 25% of the hydrogen fused into helium as far as the energy level goes. It's completely ignorable. So it's a pretty, pretty, pretty uh, big, big explosion. Um, 
But, but yes, yes, it makes a prediction. prediction. So, so if it was, if, if, if the universe, universe was really hot, hot and really dense, dense um, there, there should have been light. light. You know, you, you heat things up, um, they glow. And uh, back in the 40s, late 40s, um, Alpha, Alpha and Gamow uh, figured this out and said, "Hey, if this, if this, like, you know, this Big Bang thing is really real." So people were not sure at the time. Um, they said, "Hey, uh, well, if I go look at the helium." It, it turns out that, uh, that, uh, that the number on the x-axis there is how many photons you have at the Big Bang for every uh, regular proton or neutron. And um, if, you, if you read off the number on the top, you can say, well, there should be, um, you know, about a billion, about a billion photons for every regular, um, regular proton or neutron. And then you can say, well, I see how many protons and neutrons I see in the universe today. And that tells you that there should be a background radiation in the universe. And they, they predicted that background, background radiation, radiation should be about five degrees above absolute zero. So they said no matter where you look, you should see a glow left over from the Big Bang that's five degrees above absolute zero. Now the paper is actually, uh, this is actually the entire paper. Um, it's, it was a page long. People, people wrote short papers back then. It has five citations on it. Um, <clears throat> They, uh, uh, there was another famous physicist uh, in the department named Hans Bethe, um, and they, uh, well actually it was only Galoff, apparently Alfred was really annoyed about this because he was the grad student, he was afraid that uh, being on a paper with two famous physicists was going to overshadow his contributions. So they added Beta and called it the Alfred, Beta, and Gamoff, um, which is what passes for a joke if you're a physicist, I guess. Um, so, so they, they, they said, said yes, uh, if, you, uh, if you look anywhere in the blank sky, you should see something like five degrees above absolute zero radiation. And by radiation, I mean like, like electromagnetic photons, so radio waves in this case, microwaves, not stuff that's going to kill you. Well, it probably won't kill you anyways. So uh, um, some people at Princeton were actually working very hard uh, to try and find this. Um, but it turns out that some engineers at Bell Labs, um, Penzias and Wilson, were trying to track down in the 60s, you know, with these newfangled communication devices, um, where you talk by radio waves, um, I guess they weren't that newfangled in 64, um, they discovered that their antenna was noisier than it should have been. And uh, they said, huh, uh, this is really weird. We've done everything we can to like clean up our stuff. We tried to make good low noise amplifiers so Bell Labs can make lots of money being able to send more data over a phone line. And um, they said, well, this looks about three degrees above absolute zero. Um, but they had no idea what it was. But uh, the Bell Labs uh, was in Holmdale, New Jersey, so they said, hey, Princeton's down the road. We'll just go drive down there and see if anybody uh, knows what's going on. So they, they, found, um, they found the group uh, who were trying to build an experiment to discover this, and in a famous line, the, uh, the head of that group uh, gathered students together and said, well, boys, we've been scooped. Um, sadly, it probably was all boys back then. Um, but, but the, the discovery, uh, discovery um, got, got the 1978 Nobel Prize in Physics, physics. And, and this is really, this, this was really the the, uh, the nail in the coffin for all of the non Big Bang theories because nobody else could could explain why you had this extraordinarily uniform glow in the sky. And in fact, it's pretty bright. So um, those of you old enough to have experienced not cable TV, um, if you if you had your if you had your tuner tuned to to a random channel, there's no signal. You'd see this white snow. Well, about 1% of that, of that was, was, left, was this leftover radiation from the Big Bang. Bang. So, so it's around you everywhere, and it's, not, and it's pretty bright. Um, so uh, this is also another line of evidence that the universe did indeed used to be hot and dense. And this, uh, this sort of sets now um, that we really think we probably have a, a decent picture of the overall history of the universe, which is it started off in a hot, dense Big Bang state. It blew up. Um, and then about 400,000 years after that, the universe is cooled enough to where the light that, it, that it came from the explosion can travel towards us, and that's what we see um, as this cosmic microwave background radiation. And um, then, um, you know, after for a few hundred million years, not too that much exciting happens. The universe just sort of um, uh, keeps expanding, but things that were not quite uniform and early on keep collapsing into gravity, and eventually a few hundred million years in, million years in the universe has um, grown enough structure that the first stars and galaxies form. And then stars and galaxies continue to form, and then a few billion years after that, this dark energy stuff took over, which I'm not going to talk a lot about, but you can ask questions later on, um, <coughs> and accelerated the expansion of the universe. So it's a really weird picture, um, but it all kind of hangs together. So. Uh, 
this, this actually even shows up in, in uh, popular culture. You can get a picture of the CMB. Um, this is the spectrum, so how bright it is is a function of frequency uh, from XKCD, which there's a decent chance some of you here may have enjoyed. Um, and uh, and uh, that's actually a cosmologist. I think this works with you, right? Some? No, okay. Uh, a cosmologist who is a uh, uh, cosmologist by day and a clothing model on XKD, XKCD's website by night. Um, I do not know what the green flask is. Uh, but in fact, actually, this, this plot on the left um, got a Nobel Prize in physics uh, because this shows, um, this was a measurement of how close that radiation is to a pure black body, the, pure, the theoretical expectation, as a function of frequency. Um, and they had to blow up their error bars 20 times before people could even see the error bars on a plot. So it's just a stunning agreement. Um, it was really one of the, one of the um, well, it was before my time, but it was one of the triumphs of, uh, of, of uh, uh, late 20th century cosmology. Um, this, this plot, actually, when it was released at a meeting at the American Astronomical Society, got a standing ovation, which I've never heard of in a talk before. So it's, it's really, really pretty nice. Um, but that's not the whole story. Um, so I'm going to talk about a pair of mysteries now that are, that are sort of built into the Big Bang um, that may not be obvious. So one of them is, uh, we call it the flatness uh, problem. So, okay, what happens if you throw a ball up? It comes back down. What happens if you throw it up harder? Come down, down later. later. What, what happens if you throw, throw up, throw it up really, really, really hard, hard, like um, on a rocket, rocket hard? Doesn't, doesn't come back. back. Thank, Thank you. you. Not, Not a plant, plant I swear. swear. Um, so uh, you, you know, know, either the ball comes back over in gravity, or it, if, if you if you throw it uh, up far enough, it just shoots up and is gone, and like Voyager leaves the solar system. Um, so, so this turns out to be a very good analogy uh, for the expansion and contraction of the universe. So if I uh, start expanding the universe not fast enough, that's like throwing a ball up but not very fast. It doesn't take long for gravity to win and make it turn around and collapse again. Um, or if I, if I throw the ball up really fast, you know, leaving orbit fast, um, the universe expands so quickly that you never have a chance to form stars and galaxies. Well, that clearly happened because we exist, fortunately. Um, and it turns out, if you look at this, um, uh, would you think something was kind of funny if you threw up a ball and you came back 13 and a half billion years later and couldn't quite decide if it was going to come back down or not? I mean, that's a, that's a really finely tuned starting initial condition. And the standard Big Bang has no way to explain why that's the case. Um, so this is called the flatness problem. And, uh, and I think, I think the... Uh, the accuracy that you need to start off the expansion rate back in the early universe is comparable to guessing exactly how many atoms there are in the sun. Right? So it's like, it's not, this is clearly not happened by chance. Um, and then there's another one, which, which is maybe uh, less obvious, but also very tricky, which is, um, so let's say you're an editor and you get two manuscript submissions for 200-page novels. Turns out Virginia Woolf's, uh, I didn't have to Photoshop this together. It turns out if you search for 200-page novel, like you get a copy of three of them, which is great for me. Um, <coughs> and, and, you get, and, and you get two novel submissions, and they're identical except for one word. Would you think that was a coincidence? Now, what if these people live so far apart that they never had a chance, they, they could never have had a chance to talk to each other? I mean... Is, is that, that like possible, possible that something, something didn't happen? happen? Um, so, so that's basically what we have in the universe. Where if you look at if you look at different sides of the universe, universe so if you if you run you know if you if I look all the way over there, it's taking the age of the universe for light to travel from there to here. If I look all the way over there, it's taking the age of the universe for light to travel from there to here. So there's no way that light during the time of the universe could have gone from that side over to that side, so they have no way of knowing what temperature they are. And yet those temperatures agree everywhere to a part in about 100,000. And so um, the classic Big Bang really can't explain that. You'd expect to see much bigger differences. Um, so the fact that, um, that they are in contact, that, 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 that something must have happened to let them know their, their temperatures. Um, this is called the horizon problem. And a possible solution to this, there are actually multiple theories, but this is the most common one. 
um, I, might I might say leading, leading but then some, some people might get grumpy with me, uh, <coughs> is called cosmic inflation. inflation. And, and it turns out, it, I mean, it sounds kind of crazy, um, but it's not as crazy as you think from particle physics. So if you have a phase transition, so um, uh, like one force splits into two forces, which we actually know happens, we've seen this happen in particle accelerators. Um, then uh, that, that can actually drive the universe, uh, that the, the, the expansion rate uh, gets driven crazy high. And, and, and the universe grows exponentially for some period of time. Um, and this, this turns out that it drives the universe, it solves both of these problems, um, because the universe used to be much smaller. So these parts that I thought were a long ways away, in fact, when they started out before inflation, were very close together. So they had plenty of time for the temperature to, to even out. Uh, and, and also, it turns out that this expansion um, drives the universe towards flatness, which is basically the balance between the ball turning around and, 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 uh, and going forward. And so this nicely explains both of these uh, otherwise mysterious uh, uh, pieces of, of you know, observational facts that we see. Um, and so uh, when, when inflation came out in the uh, early, in the late 70s, early 80s, people got very excited um, because all of a sudden these two big problems, we had an answer for maybe why this was. Um, but fortunately, uh, inflation also makes some predictions about what, um, you know, not this same part, you know, the same 199,999 words should look like, but what the different words, you know, the one word that's different everywhere in space should look like. And it makes predictions for those sorts of patterns. And so we can um, go out and look for those. And in fact, um, uh, kind of entertaining, it comes from the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So if, um, you've probably heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle as I can't say where I am and how fast I'm going at the same time to some accuracy. Um, so any, any pair of variables that have those same units also turn out to be, uh, have that same, um, same uncertainty. And so if I tell you when something happened, I can't tell you exactly how much energy was there at the same time too. So that's also, that's equivalent statement to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So if the universe is very young, um, then there's an intrinsic uncertainty in how much, um, how much energy there can be, right? Because if I want to drive that uncertainty down, I've got to take a longer time to measure. But, but the universe, universe only has been alive for a very short period of time back in the early universe. universe. And, and so that means, you know, there, intrinsically there's, there's, there's uncertainty in the energy level, the density in the universe uh, because of Heisenberg. Now, inflation, when it happened, when it kicked in, stretched the universe out and actually frozen these quantum uncertainties, these quantum fluctuations from Heisenberg. And that's actually what gives rise, we think, um, to all of the structure we see around us. So the very largest things in the universe, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, were started by quantum fluctuations um, in inflation. And <clears throat> so what do we expect to see? Well, inflation predicts that these things should be sound waves. And um, as with uh, sound waves like that you've heard every day, um, High frequency, short sound waves jiggle very quickly, low frequency, long waves take a long time to run. And they all start at the beginning, so if I just look at the amplitude of a sound wave as a function of time, long ones take longer to go, to go up and down and short ones go up and down faster. But if I stop my clock at any point in time, I'll see that some of these happen to be, I happen to stop on my clock when some of these were at, at their peaks and when some of them were almost zero. And, and so, so if, if I, you know, if I stop my, happen to stop my clock now, then I see that waves of that size are zero, you know, the, the third line down, but waves of the second line down are very big, of, of that length. And um, it turns out that the, that the CMB that we see, the radiation comes from a very short period of time. It comes from, uh, you know, plus or minus a few tens of thousands of years, around 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And so basically what we are seeing is a snapshot, and that snapshot has frozen in these sound waves, um, as far as we can see. Now, they keep oscillating, but, but um, actually they don't, they stop. Um, but uh, <coughs> um, we just see a snapshot. And uh, fortunately, it turns out that looking at these waves, so remember, these waves are the part in, you know, a few parts in 100,000 that are different. Um, so they're not very bright. Um, but by looking at them, we can say a lot about the universe. So, uh, right, so what are we going to do? Well, the first thing we're going to do is try to make maps of the sky. And so this is, this is what we're going to see. And, and by analogy, right, so it's really, we're looking at a sphere, and spheres don't like to go into two dimensions. Um, this is why everybody thinks Greenland is bigger than Africa. Uh, so we, um, you know, longer to try on how to, like, do this most faithfully, but they all kind of suck, so we're just going to have to live with that. Um, but just like if you made a map of the Earth, um, like the top one, you can make a map of the sky, you can take a picture of the sky, and then unroll it in two dimensions. And um, that's sort of uh, what it looks like um, 
in the bottom picture. And so you can see, uh, you can see the Milky Way uh, is putting a lot of, um, that, you know, the, that horizontal stripe is the disk of the Milky Way. The same thing you can look over, well, not from Montreal, but if you go outside of the city, you can see the disk of the Milky Way overhead. Um, but it puts out all sorts of radiation. Um, so we'll have to get rid of that to look at the leftover radiation of the Big Bang. But you can actually see it, so at the top and the bottom, when you, in, in this picture, when you get further away from the Milky Way, you can actually see, um, See the, that, that sort of bluish, ripply structure, and that is that is from the Big Bang. That is not the Milky Way. So uh, after you do a lot of work, you can clean up all that that stuff from the Milky Way and get a picture of what you think the early universe looks like. So here's a picture from from Planck uh, satellite. We'll see a little bit more about this, um, but just to give you this is this is the sort of thing we want to generate to learn about the universe. And remember that the background temperature is uh, three degrees above absolute zero. This picture is a few hundred millionths of a degree, um, plus or minus around that, around that three degrees. Uh, and in fact, Stephen Hawking, when the first results from the COBE satellite came out, that was the one that made that, uh, that curve on the XKCD shirt, um, said that it was a discovery of the century, if not all time. Uh, and we've gotten much better since then. So uh, what we're gonna try and do and I will get out of here and play with this, which I think should still work, is um, different makeups of the universe predict that the maps of the sky should look different. And so if I, if I tweak um, what the universe is made of, um, I'm gonna try and tweak it until it matches uh, what we actually see. So here's a snapshot of a piece of the sky, and here's what, here's what the sky actually looks like and now I'm going to try and play with these numbers. So this tells me the amount of regular matter I have. This tells me the amount of dark matter I have. And this tells me the amount of dark energy that I have. So I'm going to try and tweak these. Do these maps look the same right now? No. So should I change something? What do you want, what do you want to see changed? Regular matter, dark matter, dark energy. Less normal matter. I see somebody knows what they're talking about. All right. We're gonna, is that looking closer or better? Eh, it's kind of better. It's still not right, right? So you can see there's all sorts of little ripples here that aren't showing up over here. So it's not quite right yet. It's kind of smooth. I don't know. Let's try something else. Oh, hey, that looks like it's doing better. Turns out I know the answer already. But, uh, um, well, it says we're 70% the same. Oh, hey, that's looking a lot better, isn't it? We're 86% the same. Let's try more. Oh, that didn't help. Let's try that. Oh, no, I do not want to go to the App Store. Well, we'll stop. We're getting pretty close. Um, so by twiddling these knobs, um, maybe you can make a picture of the universe that looks like what we actually see. Um, now, of course, make the maps look the same. That's not really science. That's really fuzzy. Um, and, and we're, we're scientists. scientists. We, we like error bars. bars. And, and so, so it's not actually, you know, we, we go through the maps to get to the tool we actually use. Um, so, so does anybody like, I'm sure Windows Media Player back in the 90s did this. Um, when you listen to a piece of music, it shows how bright it is. Um, these are called sonograms. Like your graphic equalizer is kind of like one of these, if you have one. Oops, not that one. Yeah, okay. So, so let's see if this works. works. So, so what, what this is going to show now is, we'll start with the wine glass. Um, I don't know if you can hear this at all. So as it scrolls by, the vertical is showing the brightness is a function of frequency. So you can see that as you raise the pitch of the wine glass, can you hear? That, um, that it uh, is going, going up. up. Now, now, of course, not everything sounds, sounds like a wine glass. glass. I'm going to try a flute. So that looks kind of different. You can try a harp. So these, these lines above, these are called overtones or harmonics. Uh, maybe you've heard of them before. And, and it's the, the ratio, you know, it's how these harmonics relate to the, to the main frequency that gives sound its character. So the, uh, the... 
trumpet has got a lot more harmonics in the heart, and the and the glass was only one. Oh, that's good for the bird, why not? Oh, that's got a lot of stuff in it. And we can even uh, play with this ourselves if we want to. So whistling is really boring, but talking has got lots of information in it. Okay, so, well, that's enough of that. Um, so what we're going to try and do is um, not look at the maps, but go to the maps to these, these sonograms. So we don't have a lot of universes to look at. We've only got the one, so we're just going to get a single slice. And that single slice is called a power spectrum. So this is kind of what it looks like um, as I... And so, so the horizontal axis now, as I go to the right, I'm making things smaller. And you can see that as I do that, um, the blobs on my, I have blobs in my map, and those blobs get smaller as I go to the right. So I'm going to try and stack up these little power spectrum bits until they agree with what I see in the sky. And we can go back to our little tool over here. Sorry, I hope you're not getting whiplash from all the uh, browser tabs and we can um, add the power spectrum in here. So now as we change this, what we're really going to try and do is change these parameters until this curve matches the one that we get from looking at this data. And I hope that made sense. Um, and we can use this uh, to tell what the universe is made out of. So here's now how the power spectrum changes. I change the amount of regular matter in the universe. So you can see that, that as I change the amount of regular matter, how the power spectrum looks changes. So if I see, you know, if I see, um, you know, a universe that's like that, I know that it's got 70, 7% uh, regular matter. Um, also, dark matter affects the CMB. So in particular, dark matter plus regular matter is what gives the first and the, and the third peaks, the odd peaks. Um, it enhances those and not the even peaks. So right away, if I see that the third peak is higher than the second peak, um, I know that there's dark matter in the universe. I don't need to know anything else. It's kind of cool, huh? And also, I know the dark matter was there, three, you know, 300,000 years, 40,000 years after the Big Bang. So it's not like I could have snuck it in stars down the road. It had to be dark matter back then. Um, right, so that's what we're going to try and find out is measure the power spectrum. Um, I will probably have to skip over some of these. Um, but how we measure it is important. Um, and the main tool, so we use lots of different telescopes, but as of now, almost all of them are, have got these really fancy thermometers um, that are called bolometers, which just means nice thermometer, um, <coughs> that are really just measuring temperatures. Um, so the, uh, as the old saying, which I learned about last night uh, goes, um, Langley invented the bolometer, a very fine sort of thermometer. It can measure the heat of a polar bear's feet at the distance of half a kilometer. Oh, I just ran some numbers, and this is actually not true. Um, uh, the, what the instruments we use today are so sensitive that if you tried to measure a polar bear's feet at half a kilometer, it would just like blow out the instrument. So um, we, we cannot do that. So I'll just briefly mention a few of the instrument experiments that McGill is involved with. Um, and oh, yeah, here's, here's actual barometers. Um, these, these came from a uh, balloon mission called uh, SPIDER. Um, so these actually flew in uh, the very upper atmosphere, about 30 kilometers, 20 kilometers up, um, <coughs> where they can measure the temperature um, in a second to about uh, a ten thousandth of a degree. And uh, we do actually, as I said, we've got, we, uh, we've got several different things that we use, um, and uh, sort of your appetite for large budgets and pain of organization depends, sets where you wanna, whether you want to work on space or on a balloon or in ground. Um, it turns out you can fix things in the ground, so if you screw up, you can, like, recover. That's much harder to do in space. Um, so the first one is uh, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. Um, so this is at an altitude of 5,200 meters in the Chilean Atacama. Um, I have been down there a little bit, and I spent a lot of time down there as a graduate student working on a different experiment that was uh, just down the road. Um, so it's, uh, it's taking lots of measurements, and uh, it is according to the... Wikipedia has everything, including a table of the highest astronomical observatories um, ranked by altitude. Uh, so this was a couple years ago. It was the fourth tallest. Uh, um, in fact, it's really tied for third because the, the third one is like just next door. But they claim to be 10 meters higher, which is not true. Um, and uh, 
I don't know. Do we have time for a sweet drone video? We do. All right. Uh, so here's a sweet drone video flying over the telescope. So this, uh, this thing around it um, is a ground shield that's trying to just protect the telescope from, from radiation, from the polar bear feet that might be half kilometer away. We don't want to see those. We want to go up. Um, and so there's a telescope in the middle. So it's a six meter telescope. And then there's a second layer of, of protection. Um, and then there are um, thousands of detectors off on the side that are in a, a vacuum vessel that's cooled to a few, uh, a few hundred thousandths of a degree, you know, less than a degree above absolute zero. And uh, that's a pretty nice shot. I'd like to learn to fly a drone sometime. Uh, okay, I think that's enough drone footage, sadly. Um, and, and it's, uh, uh, it's really, you know, it was an entertaining, entertaining <coughs> place to work. Um, the, the Chileans were afraid that the Bolivians were going to invade, so they put landmines down, uh, but then forgot where they put them, so now we can't go hiking the area. Um, there are Bolivian carjacking gangs that will, like, try and if you drive by yourself. It's, it's probably gotten worse, so um, it's on the road to Argentina, um, but it goes close to Bolivia, and the Bolivians, like, will come over and steal your car if you're not careful. Um, the, the atmosphere is half of sea level, a little, little above half of sea level, so um, I spent a week at the site once, um, and it was the only time in my life I could feel that brain cells were dying faster than I could replace them. Um, don't recommend it. Um, and, uh, oops, and, uh, yeah, actually NASA uses, uses the area to test things for Mars. Um, a thing that was fun when I was a grad student is, uh, can, you, can you see those red signs? They look really faded. Yeah, yeah, they used to be brand new, but like the week before, there was a, 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 a windstorm that was 50 meters a second wind for 36 hours, and it just sandblasted all the paint off the road signs. So, yeah, <laughs> uh, my advisor, this one I was a grad student, my advisor, was like the, the scariest day of his life was going up after the storm because we had no idea if the whole telescope had blown over or not. Um, and uh, there's actually a handy dandy volcano that's uh, about 20 kilometers away that's great uh, because it's, it's a built in weather station. You can see what the high altitude winds are doing by which way the smoke's going, um, as long as it doesn't erupt. But sometimes it does, so you have to be a little careful. Um, but here's a map, no, map of the sky. Actually, uh, much of my life as a post like I spent trying to make these maps um, using supercomputers. Um, <coughs> but uh, this is now a tiny piece. I think in the interest of time, I won't like. Yeah. Um, if, if you, you want to look afterwards, afterwards, you can actually download this um, from NASA, NASA website, and this is science quality data. data. You can look at these pictures yourself and play around. Maybe you'll find something new. We think we found most of the things, but you never know. Um, and remember I said the thing we're actually going to look at is the power spectrum. So, so here's now the power spectrum that we got from ACT. Um, doesn't mean much yet, but hopefully that will change. So another one is uh, the South Pole Telescope. Um, Cynthia Chang, who's another faculty member, spent the winter there. Um, well, one night, but one night turns out to be very long in the South Pole. Uh, so it's a 10 meter diameter telescope. Uh, Matt Dobbs, who's another McGill faculty member, um, has done a lot of work on SBT as well. Uh, Josh Montgomery, who's a student here, postdoc, um, spent a winter and, uh, and uh, upcoming winter, um, McLean Rubel is uh, planning on spending the winter, who also, in addition to be a, a student at McGill, uh, got a Montreal Best Bartender Award a couple years ago. So, brings interesting people out. And uh, <laughs> why it's not totally sure, this is one of the reasons, well, not quite, um, is, uh, is um, be, to be allowed to spend the winter at uh, the South Pole, you have to pass a psychological evaluation, which um, seems to be more or less random chance. So these are some of the questions you have to <coughs> get right to be approved to spend the winter at South Pole. Um, so, uh, you know, which, which the word does not belong, cat near sun? <laughs> Look at these. <laughs> so as it turns out, it seems to be pretty random who's approved and who's kicked out. <laughs> there are definitely people who, got, who passed who had no business going down. And uh, people who seemed perfectly fine who got kicked out. So um, if you find somebody who was going to go and was kicked out, do not judge them because they couldn't tell whether a cat near or sun didn't belong. All right. Also, sad I don't work in SBT because otherwise um, it turns out um, if you uh, play Civilization VI that uh, the Amundsen Scott Research Station is one of the wonders of the world. And you can see SBT featuring proudly in the logo right there. So... Um, never like been in a video game, but many people at McGill have. So here's the SPT map. Looks kind of like an ACT map, doesn't it? 
a little bit different, but that's, that's just projection because this is near the pole. Um, uh, but all of this stuff, right, this is really, this is all, except for the little specks, um, which are, uh, that's, those are probably mostly black holes in distant galaxies emitting radio waves. Uh, but the rest of it is all, um, is all Big Bang, micro background. So that is, that is the universe from 400,000 years after the Big Bang. And uh, here's the SPT power spectrum. Kind of looks like the ACT one, right? But still, I'm not quite, quite sure what to make of that. that. Um, and, and then there's, there's the Planck satellite. satellite. Um, so, uh, bird, bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. bush. Um, pretty, pretty accurate number of the detector in space is worth 50 on the ground. ground. Not 200, 50. Uh, so, so it turns, turns out a lot to be a lot easier to get more detectors on the ground. Um, so, so you can still win. win. But, uh, yeah, yeah, so here's the Planck satellite. I think, I think maybe, maybe during, during questions, questions I'll play the video associated with this one. one. Um, but here, yeah, you can see the map. So um, you go to space to make maps of the whole sky and to get above the atmosphere. So it's very good at measuring the large scales. Um, so here is the power spectrum from Planck. So you can see this is what's spending a billion dollars versus a few tens of millions gets you. Um, but if you go back, you can see um, right, that, that, the, uh, that the act and SBT things go much further to the right. That's because it's much easier to build a bigger telescope on the ground than in space, and bigger telescopes have better resolution. So that's the thing you win a lot by um, going, to, going to stand on the ground. And so if everything has gone well, um, we ought to be seeing the same signal from all these telescopes, right? So let's cross our fingers. Because if this is not going to be the same, then we're in trouble. Oh, hey, look at that. Woohoo, right? I mean, it's actually, uh, it's really impressive that, that three completely different telescopes with three completely different crews of people analyzing the data um, uh, got the same answer at this level of precision. In fact, it's really hard to show how good it is because uh, Python will not make points small enough that you can see the error bars in most of these data points. Um, so it's really, you know, it's really stunning, stunningly accurate data. Now, now, of course, course um, this, this doesn't really help us if, like, our model for the universe doesn't explain this, right? So, so hopefully, hopefully our model for the universe can, can fit this. And, and indeed, with just setting those densities plus um, a tilt and an overall amplitude, amplitude uh, here now is the best fit model, which you can see goes beautifully through the points. Um, so, so this is really one of the, I mean, this is really, uh, this and, I mean, I haven't had time to talk about other experiments that are also working on this, but this, this field has been really one of the um, crowning achievements of uh, cosmology, um, because it, it has transformed it from a science where if you knew your answer to a factor of two, you're doing pretty well, to now understanding what the universe is doing at, you know, percent or better level accuracy. And so just to give you an idea of this, uh, I have made a little movie where I try and now um, adjust all the other parameters but change the dark matter level and see if I can, if I can like fit the data without dark matter. And as you can see, uh, the answer is no. So if I put too much, if I don't have enough in, I just can't get those peaks right. And I've, I, I've done a fair job here. Like I, I spent a long time last night making sure the code was doing the right thing. Uh, you just can't, you can't go through the peaks. Um, without dark, dark matter. matter. And, and of course, if I put too much in, it turns out that, that, that the, the other parameters, what they end up doing is smoothing out the peaks on smaller scales. scales. So, so um, you know, if, if, so, if you came back and told me we had twice as much dark matter, matter I'd also tell you you were wrong because, because you couldn't fit this. this. So, so um, it's uh, also, uh, right, so this, this is great, but remember, um, you know, this better agree with what we get from elsewhere. So um, there's, there's a lot of independent checks of this now, but I thought I'd go back to this one we saw before. And um, now this vertical line makes a lot more sense because that vertical line is what tells us, um, so we measure from the CMB, we measure both uh, how many photons there are, that tells us the temperature and how much regular matter there is. And so that tells us where in this plot, the vertical line we should be sitting. And so all of our points, on the, the density, density curves, curves better, better, better be, uh, um, when I mention them, better be going through the, the particle physics correction, the predictions. predictions. And, and indeed they are. Um, as I said, lithium's a little bit funny, but like, like we, we got, got it mostly right. right. Well, not, not we, I didn't do anything with lithium. Um, but it's really, you know, and, and the other ones are just spot on um, at the, you know, much better than percent level. So um, this did not have to be right. This did not have to come out correctly. Um, but. It seems kind of like miraculous. Like, I can, I can, by looking at maps of the universe at 400,000 years, I can tell you exactly how much hydrogen was created in the Big Bang. 
and I go out and I measure it, I get the right answer. I can tell you exactly how much deuterium was made in the Big Bang. And I can go out and I can get that number right. Um, so I think, it, I think it's been fun. Uh, and, uh, right, so because of this, um, this is really one of our main lines of evidence that lets us say that we are really sure that we live in a universe that's 5% normal matter, 26.5% um, dark matter, and 68.5% dark energy. Now, I haven't talked about what dark energy is, mostly because we have no idea, but um, if you want to ask questions, that was the, the Hyrax telescope that, uh, that you mentioned earlier is uh, one of its main goals. Um, it acts like anti-gravity. Also very strange, but we can't make the universe work without it. Um, <clears throat> and there's a bunch of other really neat things we can measure from CMB too, um, like we can measure the energy from leftover neutrinos from the made in the Big Bang. Um, and uh, you know, we, we can measure the helium directly in the Big Bang, so we know that it was the number we measure today, but measured well before there were any stars and galaxies that made extra helium that could have screwed up the number. Um, and, and we, we also actually even, um, I didn't have time to back, talk, talk, talk about, about this either, either um, but we can say from the CMB when the first stars turned on. Um, and, and it turns out they turned on when the universe was sort of about a sixth or a seventh its, uh, its present size. And it's not over yet, so a thing that McGill is also involved with is uh, uh, upcoming Simons Observatory, which is funded, uh, and we'll be following on to this, um, but increased by about a factor of uh, 10, the number of detectors we have in Chile, um, to try and measure um, even more things, so it turns out there's quite a bit more we can still measure, um, including trying to measure directly a signal from inflation um, through polarization, which I really don't have time to talk about, but if you want to ask afterwards, feel free to. And so just in summary, um, you know, the Big Bang really does rest on, rest on several strong lines of evidence. Um, and uh, we really have very, very accurate quantitative uh, agreement with what the Big Bang model predicts and what we actually see. And this did not have to come out correct. It, it really could have been wrong. Um, but it looks right. And, uh, and it's been the work of a lot of people, but it's been really, uh, you know, it's been a great ride. And stay tuned because the ride is not over. So thank you very much for coming out and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, ish, ish. Well, actually, my, my next door office neighbor came by this morning with one, so maybe maybe that'll turn out. <laughs> um, and uh, and in fact, the the big number that he came that he came up with this morning um, was the uh, the prediction for the polarizations at sea. But um, being a theorist, he didn't actually calculate the number, so I was like, you got to tell me the number, man, before we tell you we can find it. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so, so there, there, there are, are some, some um, they, they have a very hard time, time. so uh, there's um, uh, one, one is called the ekperiodic model, um, and, and so, so that, that, that says the universe of starting from an explosion, started from a bounce, bounce. Um, but, but it's, it's very, very difficult, difficult. so think, I mean, it, it turns out that the, uh, that the, there's a tilt in the spectrum so inflation naturally predicts that, that the larger fluctuations would be ever so slightly larger than the smaller fluctuations. Um, and that's hard for a lot of computing models to get right. Um, and then also the Gaussian fluctuations. So inflation says, um, right, if I see a hot spot because there's more photons, I should see the same excess number of regular matter and the same excess dark matter in the same spot. And that does appear to be what we see, and that did not also have to be the case. So it's difficult. Um, I, it, you know, it's things like that why inflation really is by far the most serious technical game maintained. But people are still looking, because inflation is weird. Um, so if you've got a better idea, we're, we'd love to hear it. I think you were next, right? You, you yes. This one? Yes. yes. This, this one? one? Okay. okay. Yes. 
uh, take, take it, it up with the artist. artist. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes. yes. Tons. Uh, so something like this. So it, it's, it's hard to see because this is, this is an observational picture. Um, but, but people look at, at the growth of large scale structures. So as the galaxies are close together, that changes the properties of how clustered they are. And people measure that. Um, and, we, and we see things like, so it, um, you also have to be a little bit careful because galaxies are also being made. So, so there are more galaxies, galaxies you know, as time goes on, on um, as, as things, things collapse, collapse, you make more galaxies. galaxies. And, and so, so we very carefully, very quantitatively, um, um, try and compare simulations to, to what we see. And, and they actually are in quite good agreement. agreement. And, and, and uh, yes, yes, so, so we, we, we do see that the space density works out exactly like you expect it to. Once you take into account the fact that things are being created at the same time. Well, well, I don't think so. Right. So, so, so uh, like a thing I didn't have to talk, I didn't have time to talk about it is, is galaxy clusters. So that's another thing that I study. Um, and right, right, you, have to, you have to be careful because if you want to say, like, what you measure is how many galaxy clusters per unit volume I see as a function of distance. So you have to be very careful about this because um, galaxy clusters are continually being made as things, as things collide together. And they're much easier to see from large distance. Um, you know, a big clump of galaxies you just see than one galaxy. Um, but that density does agree with, with what you'd expect it to be, given, given the expansion and the evolution of the number counts as, as, they're, as they're created. So, so you really, you can't think of it as, you know, there's a thing that started out 100 million out, years after the Big Bang, and those things have been constant, and they're, and they're just getting further and further apart. The universe is, is doing stuff as time goes on. Uh, no. So, so the, 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 this, this has, has um, well, well, it has, I don't know, 100 kilos of lithium. So uh, there was, uh, oh, the lithium was a part per billion, so that means we would need to take in, take in the lithium out of 100 billion, um, uh, 100 billion kilos worth of stuff, but we already got a lot of concentration from, um, from the fact that we're an Earth and not mostly hydrogen helium. And then miners do the rest of the work. But, but yes, yes, the you know, you know the lithium, lithium number is is, is sensible, sensible given, given the Big Bang. Bang. So, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's let somebody else have a chance. chance. You, you can, can ask me more later. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Can I ask a question from your live stream? Uh, sure. sure. Okay. So Angelina asks, why is the amount of lithium off in the calculations? I assume since it's lighter and so close to helium and hydrogen, it would be one of the most prevalent elements in the universe. Uh, sadly, no, it is not. not. Otherwise, Teslas, Teslas would, would be cheaper. cheaper. Um, <clears throat> so, you, I mean, to get the prediction, you just have to work through nuclear physics. Um, so lithium is very fragile, and so it's easy to break it up. So you don't make the lithium until the very end of this. Um, and I, that's probably also, because lithium is so fragile, it's probably also why we don't see it, is because stars are very good at destroying lithium. And so if, if the stuff that we're seeing that we think is the original lithium content has gone through a star once, then most of that lithium will have been removed already. And so that's probably what's going on, why the level's a little bit low. Uh, what, this, which one? This, this one, oh, okay. Um, yeah, so, so this one. one. Um, if, uh, let's say I take a, a camera that's got a red and a blue and a green filter, and I take a picture. Of a, of a white, white screen. screen. 
Well, well depending on the shade of white, I'll see more or less light from the red or from the green or from the blue. So if it's you know a little bit pink, I'll see more red light. If it's a little bit blue, I'll see more blue light. Um, so each of those each of those uh, points is basically um, is basically a different color. But this is a microwave radiation, not not visible light, but it's the same idea. Um, and then uh, the um, the curve is the prediction. Um, that's actually the mathematical shape for the prediction. Um, that curve is actually what gave rise to quantum mechanics, was because they, they couldn't explain radiation from hot things without it. Um, so that is the prediction of how bright the sky should be at each frequency, at each color. And so the, the curve is the prediction from the black body, and then the points are the actual measured points that agree um, stunningly well. Is that enough of an explanation? Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Or? All right. Well, thank you very much.